Chapter 15. My Conclusion. I concluded by giving a recommendation that Gwen should act as secretary, and by no means Mrs Everett. I continued by saying I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. I further explained. I would write to the churches where I was engaged to preach to avoid them embarrassment, for they could not have me preach, being out of membership with you or anyone. The question you should now ask is, where does this leave us and what are we to do? During my conversation with Mr Crane, I explained my dilemma, that as secretary, I was now due to correspond with those ministers who were engaged to preach next year. And due to the recent controversies being always upon my mind, I had a draft of a letter that I had prepared to send to all the ministers next year. But I thought, surely, I have enough to do, intended my family and setting my own house in order, let alone any church recommendations to other ministers, and felt it would be better left and save all the agonies of such a problem. Let me read you the draft. Letter to our visiting ministers. Some of our ministers have referred frequently to the chapel at Beaton as the house of God, both in their preaching and in prayer, the result being to allow some here to court notions that the chapel building is where God dwells and is a holy sanctuary, that the communion table and vestry are all holy vessels unto God, that they are to be reverenced. As a member and being called to preach, I have cause to consider this matter in my preaching and at the church meetings. I have taught that the church of the living God is the house of God, that God does not dwell in temples made with hands, Acts 17, that all the Old Testament shadows are all fulfilled in Christ and his church, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true tabernacle of God, that the union of the divine nature at the Incarnation in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, constitutes the true unique temple of God. Further to this, according to the promise, the whole church being united in Christ at regeneration and effectual calling, these are indwelt of God the Holy Ghost. Revelation 21 verse 2, 1 Timothy 3.15, John 4.33, John 2.19-20, 1 Corinthians 3.16. Some have opposed me in this matter and have resisted the truth. I would appreciate you bear this in mind should you ever refer to the house of God when preaching to the congregation gathered at Beaton. Yours in concern for the cause of truth and Christ, David Clark, 1984. I asked Mr Crane what he thought of such a letter and he expressed that it may have the following repercussions. The ministers may think you are criticising him personally. But, Mr Crane said, the whole affair had caused him to consider such phrases because he himself had used the terms and was now very careful himself. The minister may react and say, whom do I think I am to write in such a way? But surely that would be wrong, and he could see the concern expressed. He may feel there's nothing wrong with the letter and take thought of the matter as requested. Mr Crane thought there was nothing wrong with the letter and it would be in order to send it. Mr Crane expressed to me he knew, he knew to some degree the minds of the church and that the church did not wish me to leave because we were so few. Let me say this, neither do I wish you to leave because the whole affair will be very painful. I have children to consider and also my wife etc. and I realised should I leave you there is much, there must come a strain of relationship not only with us in the village but also throughout the churches. I could not join any other church without them judging this affair amongst us, nor could I be involved in any other church being not in membership anywhere, and so this would affect family and myself. I would be looked upon with suspicion. To bring up my family amongst them that fear God would prove difficult. I think possibly I would have to remain alone, but if this was the path I am to go, this is the way ordained of God for me, then by the grace of God I would take it. But I did not welcome the path with open arms. Nevertheless, for the sake of truth, I must take and walk that path. What are the alternatives? What can we do? How can we resolve the problem? Let me first say, of all this, there is a great question mark raised in my mind regarding Mr King. After my letter to him, 
in May 1983. See the chapter 1983. See that chapter. Mr King has relinquished his responsibilities of church membership. He will not attend church meetings and has declined any request to partake in meetings except the prayer meeting. Now why is this? Am I the cause of this evil? Have I acted with an evil mind in this matter? What am I to do? Who will give me good counsel? The church, the church have grieved that Mr. King takes leave of church responsibilities and preaches in other churches. Mr. King has expressed his health is not too good and he has a nervous complaint and no doubt my letter and its contents has been no means helpful to him. But what should I have done in light of these circumstances? The church does not understand nor do they agree with my actions and beliefs, but they still say, why doesn't Mr. King and I get on together? The church want, or it appears, my services of being only a male member, but it appears not the doctors I teach shall defend. Oh, that I could find good counsel. My experience is such that I believe I'm being proved or tried, and the question being asked is, am I a faithful servant of Lord Jesus Christ or no? I tend to feel that those onlookers would say, lay down your weapons of war and be at peace. What you're doing is no good. Do you really think these affairs are important and should not love for these people prevail? How can you do this to these ladies? What will become of them and what will become of you and your family? Conscience speaks. I have to do what any faithful Christian would do in light of the circumstances in this matter. I look to the Lord God to vindicate my work. Mrs. Everett will not attend weeknight meetings if I take the communion, or either of them, if I am officiating. This stemming from my stand against her, insisting I have reverenced the communion table and the building in the vestry. It has now developed into views with respect to the law and the gospel. In both cases, I believe Mr. King and Mrs. Everett are wrong and out of order as church members, but had it not been for my contending for the truth of the gospel, I would never have met nor caused these ills and trouble. Some people say, it is my manner which upsets, etc. I believe that both Mr. King and Mrs. Everett should be brought under discipline of the church, for this is the correct procedure. However, this does not seem to have been the view of the church. So what should I do? Am I he that troubleth Israel? Oh, that help should be given. May the Lord Jesus Christ appear to be our Saviour and deliver us to be obedient to him, and may his grace be sufficient for us. If I am to stay, then may we set in order those things which are out of order, and I am sure that is what you all want. May I then outline the areas that are out of order, the relationship between Mr King and myself, matters related to Mrs Everett. In both these matters, if I am to remain, we must apply the scriptural principles and follow the pattern given of God to put them right. Mr. Crane and I must work together. What must be done? Any church discipline must be enforced. Mrs. Everett's recent assertions related to the law of Moses and the gospel must be opposed, as this is contrary to the gospel and the gospel said at Article 16 and of our Confession of Faith. That the Lord Jesus Christ directs believers to use it as a pattern for their conduct. In this matter, she errs, and sadly to say, many do. But when you join the Gospel Standard cause, I wrote to you expressing my agreement with the Article 16 of the Gospel Standard Articles. Here is the letter which I wrote to the Church on the 12th of February 1981, and my address was from at Wigston Magna at that time. Dear Mrs Everett, thank you for your letter of the 24th of January 1981, informing me of the outcome of the recent Church meeting. May I confirm my approval and desire to help the cause of Beaton when, though my present circumstances are not helpful, I believe the gospel standard cause are a means by which God is preserving his truth in the world, in particular the articles of faith which treat the relationship to the law as believers and particular redemption and the declaration of the gospel as opposed to offering the gospel all doctrines which the majority of churches of our day deny. I believe also that a right understanding of these truths is the means of preserving a true godly fear and reverence in our worship of God, as has been in the past and can be seen by looking at the history of former gospel standards, of former gospel standard believers before this century. If the law were the believer's rule, 
then the Sabbath day being the seventh day of the week must be observed according to the law. It is precisely this article of faith which distinguishes particular Baptists such as J.C. Philpott of the last century, see Gospel Standard 1981, where he argues the case with the Presbyterian minister. Also, William Gasby's works, Volume 1. Also, The Perfect Law of Liberty. Also, John Bunyan, concerning the Seventh-day Sabbath, where he denies the Sabbath is moral. Also, Dr. John Gill, in his body of practical and doctrinal divinity. Under the Day of Worship for the Christian. Also, read Huntington's work, Forty Strikes for Satan, Save One. His writings are full of the doctrine of Christian liberty. The Christian is neither under Moses' rod nor rule. We are saved from that bondage. See also J. Calvin on the Fourth Commandment in the Institutes. I know the present-day strict Baptists have got the Sabbath and first day of the week mixed up and wrongly express the biblical position in their zeal for righteousness which needs to be addressed in this next generation of men who stand for Christ. Now here is the Gospel Standard article of faith, which I believe to be true, and which, as a Gospel Standard Church, you recently affirmed was your position. Article 16. We believe the believer's rule of life is the Gospel, and not the moral law issued upon Mount Sinai, which has no glory in it by reason of the glory which excelleth it. That is the Gospel. See the article and Scripture references for yourselves. Now in this matter, Mrs. Everett ought not to meddle with things too high for her. However, I know very few men among the Gospel Standard today have clear understanding of these matters. Nevertheless, they have responsibilities to do so, since they have all subscribed to them. Since this is the case, what course of action must I take? On my part, to walk honestly, and in the midst of the Church, I know where I stand doctrinally in respect to these issues, and teach the same but I find divisions, and people hold their opinions even amongst they that have professed to believe these articles when joined in their respective churches. In one Gospel Standard Church I defended another of these articles, Article 26, which was concerning duty faith and duty repentance. I was criticised by a minister and some of the members because it would seem they opposed me. We also have men who come to preach here at Beerton that are in Gospel Standard Churches who deny Article 26, and others, as Mr. Paul Rowland and Mr. H. Sayers. You may say, how does this concern us? I say in every way. It should, because you solemnly subscribe to the Gospel Standard Articles when you joined in 1981. As a church, we have responsibilities. Here is the letter from Mrs. Everett informing me of this act of the church. Dear David, just a line to let you know the result of our church meeting of the 16th of January 1981. It was decided, taken by ballot unanimously, that we join the Gospel Standard causes. It was a wonderful meeting, I'm sure led by the Holy Spirit. Mr Hope, the chairman, kindly consented to deal with the correspondence, etc. Signed, Mrs G. Everett. On sec. I reply to this letter, as you know, as I have already referred to. Mr Sayers and Mr Rowland agree to our articles set out in our trustee in 1831, but not the Gospel Standard Articles. As you know, as a Gospel Standard cause, we are required to not have them preach, since they have actually denied and do not accept the Gospel Standard Articles. This is not my opinion, but what we agreed when we became a Gospel Standard cause. This matter needs to be resolved if we are to walk honestly as a church. I see two alternatives. Cease to be a gospel standard cause, and then we don't have to answer to others. Or, prepare a written statement expressing the doctrinal beliefs of this church in respect to the disputed articles, and then submit them to our visiting ministers, and the same to the gospel standard committee. Ensure visiting ministers do not teach contrary to the doctrines we hold to and invite those ministers who we feel in conscience to invite, that the secretary be given leave to invite ministers who agree with our confession. We have already taken in the past open and strict communion Baptists. The matter should be left with the governing men of the church. My preference is that we adopt the second alternative, that is, to say we prepare a written statement as to our own position. It would be helpful for the cause of truth and myself. I say this because I believe what was intended by the original formers 
of these articles of the gospel standard are in accordance with the word of God. But in our day, and I must speak, there are very few men that have a clear understanding of these disputed doctrines. When I ask here and there, they have their own views, and there seems there are none who can stand and say, this is where we stand. They seem to follow one another. My recommendation would be to write our own statement of belief in respect to the disputed articles. The one already mentioned in respect to the law and the gospel, and Article 26, we have a minister coming, Mr Howard Sayers, who denies this article. It reads, We deny duty faith and duty repentance. I must read it to you because it concerns us all, and for the benefit of any ministers who hear this recording. These terms signify that it is man's duty to spiritually, savingly repent and believe. We also deny that there is any capacity in man, by nature, to do any spiritual good whatsoever, so that we reject the doctrine that man, in a state of nature, should be exhorted to believe in or turn to God. This article causes controversy because it's badly written. This is how it should be rendered, having considered the objections against it. I wrote this when vexed in spirit and was to preach on the subject we deny duty faith and duty repentance, terms which signify it is every man's duty to live by faith upon the benefits and merits of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we reject the doctrine and practice of calling upon men whilst in a state of nature to believe in or turn to God in this saving way. For these graces and blessings are wrought in the elect by the Spirit of God according to the terms of the new covenant of grace, and they're not legal duties but we believe all men in a state of nature should, re should repent of their ungodly deeds and believe the gospel report concerning Jesus Christ our Lord. All men must be exhorted to these duties. Acts 17 verse 30, Acts 8 22, Acts 26 20. By this means we confirm our belief there is no spiritual power or good whatever in the natural man to please God. I say this is a better rendering and would solve some of the difficulties which have been caused this past hundred years. Article 31 to 34 reads, We believe that it will be unsafe from the brief records we have of the way in which the apostles under the immediate direction of the Lord address their hearers in certain special cases and circumstances to derive absolute and universal rules for ministerial addresses in the present day, under widely different circumstances, and we further believe that the assumption that others have been inspired as the apostles were has led to the grossest errors amongst Romanists and professed Protestants. Therefore, that for a minister in the present day to address unconverted persons, or indiscriminately, all in a mixed congregation, calling upon them to savingly repent, believe and receive Christ, or perform any other acts depending upon the new creature power of the Holy Ghost, is on the one hand to imply creature power, and on the other to deny the doctrine of special redemption. 34. We believe that any such expression as to convey to the hearers the belief that they possess a certain power to flee to Christ, while in an unregenerate state, so that unless they do this, close with Christ, they shall perish, are untrue, and must therefore be rejected. And we further believe that we have no scriptural warrant, taking the exhortations in the Old Testament intended for the Jews in national covenant with God, and apply them in a spiritual saving sense to unregenerate men. Now I say this needs to be clarified for the benefit of our generation. We have lost the men that faithfully understood and will teach these things from first principles. We have lost them, I say, but I believe the substance of what is being said here is correct, but badly treated. It needs to be clarified in light of the history of the added articles. 34 I agree with and must be taught, for this also deals with the whole relationship between the law and the gospel. The Jews were under the law in covenant, therefore cannot apply the exhortations for them to live as a people separated and having natural blessings, and bring them to the gospel sense to unconverted Gentiles and so on. This must be taught and needs to be explained. We ought to do so as a church for the benefit of the next generation. 
I need to know where you stand, where the so-called committee stands. I believe many of the men do not fully understand themselves. Let them speak if they can. Defend the truth I must. So I suggest we adopt the latter alternative. Let me press on. I have two more points. The singing of the hymns by the children, such as you have mentioned. This has grieved you. It has me, and I'm sorry if I've caused you undue hardship or concern. If Arthur were here, I would apologise to him if I've offended him wrongly and embrace him in the bonds of, of gospel love. Him 169 reads, Show me the scene in the garden of bitter pain, and of the cross where my Saviour for me was slain, sad ones for bright ones, so that be stories of Jesus tell them to me. I maintain we must not put these words in the children's mouths, for in the end it may turn out to their confusion they are not the children of God at all. Another hymn. I do not want to pick things to pieces. It is a dreadful task. Hymn number 108. God loves the little children. We know the Lord Jesus came into the world to save his elect, who are styled as little children. The love of God knows no change. These hymns are teaching Arminianism. It cannot go on. They deny the sovereign free grace and love of God to the elect. You must be selective when choosing hymns for the children. If you cannot, then let us produce a Sunday school hymn book which is according to our confession of faith. Now, I'm not seeking to control anyone. Perhaps Mr Crane could speak to the Sunday school teacher, including Mrs Watson, regarding this matter, stating our doctrinal position, just as I suggested with our ministers. We have a responsibility. Now to my last point. I have mentioned in the past perhaps we ought to have occasional meetings, special meetings, which are important currently in our day. For instance, I mentioned during the time the Pope was to visit Britain that we should hold meetings at the chapel, inviting a minister or such to give us some instruction as believers as to our responsibilities, how we are to act during this time and climate and time of history in which we live. You remember the church declined my request to use the chapel for this meeting or the Sunday school room, that it would be all right to hold such a meeting in a hall down the road, but not the chapel. The words were, we have some Roman Catholic friends and we would not want to offend them. Mr King said this. I subsequently held a meeting in my home and asked the national organiser of the British Council of Protestant Churches to give an address and that was Mr. Reverend G. Ferguson. I also mentioned, at a later date, a lecture concerning the Reformation. We perhaps ought to have them and invite men, such as Mr. G. Ashdown of the Protestant Alliance, who could faithfully teach the history of the Reformation. We perhaps could invite the local churches and churches from a distance. They need to be taught these things. Our children are not taught these things in schools now. At one time... At one time, in the Protestant school, when Church of England had religious education, these things were taught in schools. They are no longer taught. Other religions are being taught. We, as a people that fear the living God, knowing history, must teach our children. But it is the church that has a responsibility. What I put to the church was a reasonable request and part of our duty. What happened? It was asked, would the trustees be in favour? Dare we do this? No other churches are doing this. Now, dear, we are living in severe times, and as a church, we should be awake. The church ought to be guided by those that see the times and know the times and read the times. Let me give you an illustration. I have spoken to you a half year ago about such things. Look now what's happened in print. Britain Protestants face a sellout. I do not think this is a Christian group writing this. Britain Protestants are likely to face a major test of their loyalty and faith during the next four years. Reason? The decision by the Church of England to unite with the Roman Catholic Church and to restore papal authority once more in England. Such move, however, could have far-reaching consequences both in the United Kingdom and the monarchy for union with Rome will mean constitutional changes involving the Bill of Rights and the Act of Settlement. Evidences 
that the British of Roman churches will close an agreement on unity was made clear last February when a joint statement of the two churches announced will be reunited. The Pope at that time will be the universal primate. At the present time, our monarch on the throne has sworn allegiance to the Protestant faith. The mechanisms and machinery of the hierarchy and officials of the Church of Rome are working behind the scene to cause our Queen to abdicate from the throne and Prince Charles to ascend. He will not be required to give his allegiance to the Protestant faith, for the coronation oath will be altered to enable this to take place. How do I know? I read the scripture and see history unfold. And where will the church be? In the wilderness. Now, where are our ministers that tell us these things? Let them that see speak from the housetops, those things that are seen. Let them be faithful to the people. I believe I have a measure of light given. Where does it come from? The grace of God. Sinful man. Who deserves it? Look at my friends in Aylesbury, drug takers, addicts, broken homes, marriages failed. Why did God select me from this people? The grace of God makes men to differ. Nothing more. There's no boasting here. I had no education. The grace of God gives wisdom. All by free grace. All through Christ Jesus. I suggest, then, in conjunction with Mr Crane, we should hold such meetings without seeking such permission. This should be attended to. It must be attended to. It ought to be put right. I have said a lot. My position to the church is as follows. If you can go along with my recommendation, and they are acceptable, then let us call upon the name of the Lord, that he appear for us and continue according to the word of the Lord. If you find you don't agree with my doctrine and are opposed to my suggestions, then give me leave to go and free me of my responsibilities to go where the Lord, I trust, will direct me. Please loan this tape to anyone you feel can give you direction. I shall ask Mr King to listen, and Mrs Everett, make your decision. After you've discussed this matter among yourselves, at our next church meeting, I want you to tell me what you would have me do. Now, I've said an awful lot. At times like these, we know our absolute dependence upon the Lord. But I know this, I believe this to be true. If there be but one believer, or two, thousands are put to flight as God uses them for the furtherance of the gospel. Will you walk with me, or do I walk alone? I will ask you, please, consider this matter. Please talk it amongst yourselves. You know me. I may seem unapproachable, but please believe me, I try to be. Could I give my all for you? I have a family to bring up. I have love for you folk here. My desire is that the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ should be preserved here. The churches in ours we do not see. They need to be enlightened. If God will appear for us, then may we be a light to the Gentiles around. But we must talk according to the Bible, be governed by the gospel of ordinances, and according to the rule and pattern set for the churches. I would ask you then, we have a church meeting shortly. I think it's in July. In the meantime, I'll do my best to engage our ministers for you whilst in membership. I'll discharge my responsibilities. I must do it. I have a concern for you. I would not go to this extreme. I would not do this if I did not have a concern for you. Can we then close? And may the Lord have the glory. Amen. Further to this meeting, I gave the tape recording of my address given to the church, both to Mr King and Mrs Everett. Mr King said he would not listen to a tape recording, nor read any letter sent from me, and there was one above who knows all. Mrs Everett also returned the tape, enclosing a letter expressing she would not listen to the tape recording. The following is a copy of her letter. I returned the cassette. I have not heard it. It is abhorrent to me that the business of the church should be mechanically recorded on a cassette. There should have been a proper church meeting, as all things should be done decent, within order, and confidential. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and walk wherein ye shall find rest for your souls. Jeremiah 6, verse 6. Touch not, taste not, handle not, Colossians 2.13, 
and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, verse 2. To him be glory. Yours sincerely, Gladys Everett. At the time I groaned within, as it was such a serious error. My wife, however, saw the funny side of the matter and found it laughable. Mrs. Everett had no idea of the spirituality of the gospel truth and goes to show that unless a person be born again they cannot see, let alone enter the kingdom of God. At that time it almost appeared as though the hand was written on the wall, me nai, me nai, tickle you farsin. I wonder how many people in the church were like this. What had happened? What could happen?